Very good afternoon. It's Penuel the Black Pen. Um, I sat down at some point with Usisu Mandi Samashiko on the panel show, which is one of the platforms that I run with a team of mine. And in the conversation, because I host conversations, the topic of UNISA came up. And I was not even aware at the time, and I think both of us were not aware at the time, that it was going to cause a bit of a storm. So the sit down today is to sit with Usis Mandisa and to speak about basically the storm that happened and to hear maybe some of her other thoughts as well. And I think just to start off, um, I'm going to start by greeting, of course, before people actually think I'm disrespectful. Sis Mandisa, thank you so much for joining me uh, this afternoon, and I hope you're well. I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. So I'm going to read two communications, one from UNISA, one from the CHE, and then I'm going to allow Sis Mandisa to then share her thoughts on the communications and other matters as well. The first one is from UNISA. It came out, I think, beginning of April, somewhere there. UNISA rejects utterances made by Mandisa Mashiko. The University of South Africa, UNISA, has taken note of the interview by Penuel the Black Pen with Mandisa Mashiko, who made unjustified and un unsubstantiated statements that UNISA is currently under investigation for fake degrees, for people writing curriculum for others, for running classes, for corruption, and lots of things in inverted commas. She also likened UNISA to some, open quote, Nigerian universities, close quote, that she alleges have no legitimacy, and in brackets, though they are accredited. UNISANS and the rest of the university community should dismiss the misleading utterances of Ms. Mashiko with the contempt they deserve. UNISA's academic integrity, credibility, legitimacy, and stature is not in doubt. The university continues to shape futures of various people across the world, including leaders of various sectors of society. It makes a tremendous contribution to the higher education sector by graduating around a third of all graduates in South Africa. As a public institution of higher learning that is governed by a range of applicable rules and regulations, including those relating to quality assurance and accreditation, we remain in, fo in focused in supporting and promoting the academic project of our university and strive to improve student support that enhances their positive experience of UNISA. Having said that, UNISA calls upon Ms. Mashiko to withdraw her utterances and apologize to UNISA. The university reserves the right to also challenge Ms. Mashiko legally. So that's the first one that I'd like her to respond to. The second one is from the Council on Higher Education, the CHE, which is Communique 3 of 2023, uh, it is signed off by Dr. Whitfield Green, the Chief Executive Officer of the CHE. It's to all higher education stakeholders and interested persons, and the subject is correcting inaccurate information about the Council on Higher Education aired on the Black Pen podcast. The Black Pen is a YouTube podcast hosted by Mr. Penel Mlodra. An interview was conducted with Ms. Mandisa Mashiko on 27 March 2023, in which the Council on Higher Education was portrayed inaccurately. These inaccuracies are corrected below. Number one, the correct name for the organization is the Council on Higher Education, the CHE, rather than the Council for Higher Education. The correct acts which govern higher education in South Africa are the Higher Education Act, Act 101 of 1997, as amended, and the National Qualifications Act, Act 67 of 2008, as amended. The CHE is an, independent, is an independent statutory body. The Council on Higher Education is not investigating the University of South Africa, UNISA. Rather, UNISA is participating in an institutional audit process that is a national process in which all higher education institutions, both public and private, are involved. The institutional audits are being undertaken as part of the CHE's mandate as the Quality Council for Higher Education in the country. The board of the CHE does not consist of the vice chancellors of universities. Rather, it consists of a range of people who are experienced in and have knowledge, and have knowledge about higher education specifically and education more generally. Whilst it is possible for a vice chancellor to be appointed to the council, there are currently no vice chancellors who are members of the Council on Higher Education. The appointment of the board of the CHE is stipulated by the Higher Education Act and the public have the right to participate in the nomination process as it was carried out, for example, 
in 2022, resulting in a new council taking up their positions on 15 December 2022. I'd just like to thank the gentleman who stopped me at some point in a shopping mall in Johannesburg to actually forward this communication to me. I think from my side, Mandisa, to start with, my mom, who you know, went to UNISA and has a qualification. And a lot of people out there are UNISA qualification holders. A lot of them were shaken um, by the clip that trended on social media. A lot of them are worried about their qualifications and the fakeness uh, of them. So I don't know if you are willing to maybe give them an assurance from your side in saying maybe their qualifications are valid, etc. And then secondly, to maybe speak to these two communications, your thoughts about them, how you feel about them, and uh, whether you still stand by what you said on the panel show. I don't know. Are these people paying you to do this? They are not, officially. Okay. Officially, they are not, on the record. Okay. I was, I was not asked by so, anyone, by the way. So, the Council on Higher Education, on. thank you so much for that um, correction. Unfortunately, they misspelled your surname in that communication. Exactly. So, we. why don't you correct them? I'm because letting you know now, on the record. No, yeah. but correct it. The way you took the time and effort and energy sure. to read out these letters addressed to me by two sure. large institutions, you know, deeming it fit to attack an individual and a woman. It's a epitome of South Africa's misogynistic character, a racist and misogynistic character, and, and real deep hatred for women because the reality is that women, unless, of course, they get corrupted, which does often happen, uh, but women generally do not have a propensity towards corruption. And in the instance where women do have a propensity towards corruption, often you find them in what I call the patriarchal princessing role, where they are either engaged in intimate relationships with men who are in positions of power and um, then collude with those men. And those men actually give them lucrative positions mm. um, so that they are able to do exactly as they wish. Um, I, I'm not going to use the phrase that is normally used to describe such a relationship by men in most cases. I've, I've heard it being tried on me very, uh, you know, often. So firstly, I'll never apologize to UNISA nor the Council on Higher Education. You need to repeat that. Okay. I will not apologize to them. Okay. The same way I never apologized to Lebohang Maile and Paul Mashatile in 2019 when they sent me legal letters uh, threatening to sue me, actually attempting to sue me mm. for a million rand each because I called them corrupt. Right? Okay. And I use the term Alex Mafia to describe generally how they've been described for a good odd 20 years. Mm. And today we see with all sorts of evidence coming out, not even evidence, people mm. in the man's life himself, uh, Paul Mashatile, talking about you know unthinkable situations where he's alleged to be paying Bob of 500,000 a month mm. to one woman and I don't know how much money the other one claims to be getting. I mean, <laughs> unless you have a company that's listed on the stock exchange, I don't know how you can afford that kind of money. So I did not apologize to those two. I'm not going to apologize to UNISA, okay. nor to the Council on Higher Education. Um, corruption is normally shrouded by an, an aura of secrecy and fear. I went to UNISA during this week for a meeting with one of the unions there who invited me, saying that they welcome the comments I made and they represent various other stakeholders inside UNISA, including very senior executives at UNISA who were very happy that somebody has said something about the situation. Here's the truth and the reality, is that there's massive amounts of corruption at UNISA. Mm. I forwarded you a report which I received um, illegally, right? And they should take me to court for that. I'm admitting I've received this report, and I received it through illegal means. Not illegal means that I did. We, whoever got it didn't get it through the usual process that you're supposed to follow when you get... Uh, you know, reports and, and information in relation to untoward activities. And I need them to also take me to court for that because I want to stand in front of a court. And by the way, I'm not going to have a lawyer. I am going to have a legal team. I already have a legal team mm. that's working on this these threats. But I will represent myself. I don't need a lawyer to fight UNISA's corruption. So there's a report that was concluded during the time of Professor, is it Makanya? Mm. I think it's Professor Makanya. I'll correct myself now. I just want to see the heading of the report. The report is entitled Investigation on Behalf of University of South Africa. Mm. Remind me to come back to the South Africa part, which is one aspect of this entire saga that really upsets me and makes me very emotional as a patriot 
and a diehard nationalist of this country and an indigenous citizen of this country. Um, this report basically was looking into allegations, and I'm going to read verbatim the title of the report. Allegations relating to secondment and acting roles of personnel impacting governance and administration, underlying those two words, mm. governance and administration in the university. So I've given you a copy of this report, and I think many people will have access to it because I've basically spread it far okay. and wide. And I'm the one who spread it after receiving it from a source okay. who is a whistleblower. There must be a protection of whistleblowers in this country. As we know, um, Babita Takaran was shot dead. And killed. Uh, Mam was shot dead mm. for fighting a mine and its corruption in a community. Many women are being attacked for resisting corruption. And the reason women resist corruption is because we give birth to all of you. Mm. And we are under siege economically and socially, right? We are abused by society. Tabo Besta is a classical example. There's another gentleman called Gerard Ackerman. Due to the protection of white privilege and the advancement of white privilege in this country, journalists are not talking about Gerard Ackerman or Ackerman Gerard. Mm. He has been accused of molesting or sexually somehow exploiting over 740 children, I don't know if it's boys mm. only, could be boys only. His case is in the Johannesburg High Court right now. Nobody's talking about it. Yes, of course, Tabo Besta is a monster, but everybody is feeding, it's a feeding frenzy of Tabo Besta and Dr. Nandipa, I, I, I don't Not know how to mind. pronounce her surname, uh, because they are black, right? There was also another judge, uh, I think he was a high court judge, I don't have his name now, who was accused of molesting a, a friend's daughter. And because I'm an activist, a lot of people approach me to help them with sensitive cases. The son, the father of this of this girl, uh, approached me for assistance. These are two white people. The victim is mm. white. The perpetrator is white. And this person was a, a judge or is a judge. I'm not sure because he never gave me the name. Right? Okay. He wanted to keep the name secret. I was supposed to attend one of the court cases, but the processes in the Department of not Department of Justice in the courts. Um, was so flawed and so corrupted and so um, messed around with that the case, I think, either took a very, very long time to sit and when it eventually sat, it was just uh, subjected to postponements and, and all of that. Come back to the UNISA situation. I'm not going to apologize to UNISA. I do not owe UNISA an apology. UNISA owes South Africa a, an explanation. They carry the name of our country in the name of their university. I'm a citizen of this country. And if you carry the name of my country as a citizen, I have a right. I don't need permission from anybody to even level accusations against you, which can be proven. This report is in relation to nepotism that has been found to be real, and people have benefited from it. And it impacts a Kosati union called Nehao. Um, it's a very long, convoluted story, but you need to basically read the entire, I think it's 70 pages of the report. Mm. The recommendations of at the end are very few. I think there's three recommendations. One of them says that the, the employees that were promoted or second, given secondment positions without quali you know, meeting qualification criteria, having the necessary qualifications to be in those acting roles, need to either pay back the money or and they need to be, uh, those roles need to be reversed. And further investigations need to be conducted at UNISA, even criminal investigations in this issue. Now, what does this impact on this report? This report firstly has been kept secret. You don't know about it. The mm. public doesn't know about it. I had to get it through, um, you know, creative means to substantiate my case. But there's also um, uh, the Council on Higher Education, uh, you know, obviously because they want a reason to sue me, but they cannot disprove what I said. Mm. They cannot disprove and they cannot um, actually um, give South Africans the confidence that in actual fact what I said is not true because they are using the power and the privilege of being the authority of the universities. And so if there is a, a, an investigation, which I know there is a whistleblower told me, and I'm not going to divulge yes. the, 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 the identities of my whistleblowers. A whistleblower told me inside, who is a professor at UNISA, that there is an investigation into the credibility and the integrity of UNISA qualifications currently. Mm. Now, you say that um, people are concerned who are graduates of UNISA. 
rightfully so. Yes. Of course they should be concerned. It's not only the graduates of UNISA that should be concerned. It's the citizens of South Africa that should be concerned. Our name is being dragged, you know, through the mud as South African citizens because of the corruption in society but that emanates and starts from um, uh, and is cooked from government and state entities. We all know about it. There's a whole entire, how many, four volumes of the Zondo Commission report. And even the Zondo Commission report mm. doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. It doesn't matter how alarmist that might sound. It doesn't begin to scratch the surface. Municipalities were not probed. And, the, and, and over, how many, like, I think only 43 municipalities out of 200 and about 70 270 or 280 municipalities in South Africa are functional. 43. Hmm. Functional. And within that 43, very, very few are viable, which means going concerns. Because a municipality is basically a business, right? That has services to offer and it charges money for hmm. its services. It's not a social development department, etc. Even though it does have a business unit that will deal with social development because of the condition of the country in terms of economic inequalities. So UNISA is a public university, which means it's government. It's not a PTY limited like ESCOM or SAA. Mm. Okay, So it's not a private company. It's a statutory body. I mean, I know the, the what do you call them, the government bureaucrats will come back and you know put ticks and crosses next to the language that I use. It's mm. fine. If it's not a statutory body, they must find, you know, give us the right language. But it's an aid entity of government. Yes. It's owned by the Department of Higher Education completely. It's a public university. It's owned by the citizens. It's supported, I think, maybe to about maybe 50%, and then the other 50% would be the people who pay the university fees. Mm. I'm not sure if it differs university to universities, but that grant that comes from us in government um, has reduced uh, over the years, and I'm not sure whether it includes NFSAS. Now, let me tell you something else that UNISA is doing right now that they need to sue me for, because I'm waiting for them to, you know, to take me to court. They've sent me a letter of some sort asking for an apology. I didn't reply to that letter. I've received it in my mailbox, um, and I'm not going to reply to it. They don't deserve my reply. I'm not a thief. I'm not corrupt. I've never ever been corrupt. I've been offered a lot of corrupt deals mm. in my life and I've rejected all of them because I will not steal from myself and from my own country. Like yes. I don't see the point of that. There's enough calamity in Africa right next door to us. Sadi countries are collapsing, have collapsed with the exception of Botswana and maybe Namibia, right? So I'm not trying to work towards an, a, a worse future for myself and my child by sitting around and, and, and basically playing lady or whatever the how role it is that we're supposed to be playing as citizens while people are looting us dry. So it's not my problem that UNISA feels like this entire thing is an attack on them. Of course it, in a, it, it is an attack on them. They've got a lot to answer for. Now in March, just before the end of March, before the 31st of March, 33,000 undeserving students who were not approved by NFSAS were included in a financial uh, transaction in excess of a billion by UNISA. Um, I, 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 I don't want to speculate on the reasons, but here's how NFSAS works, right? You have to get a certain grade. It's like a bursary. Yes. You have to maintain a certain grade of performance, quality of performance, for you to continue getting the NFSAS grant. 100%. Every year, one. every year, when the, or I don't know whether they do the biannual, like half yearly, or only once a year, or whether they look at the final results only, or the June results, but every year, prior to the university receiving the grant from NFSAS, right? They need to supply the results of every student that is on NFSAS. Mm. And that result must be compliant with this criteria. Mm. Like when you have a bursary from a private company, you have to get a certain grade. Otherwise, the, 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 the bursary automatically falls off. So with NFSAS, if a student does not meet that grade consistently, they lose the, 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 the grant, mm. right? But UNISA made a transfer. And I dare them to deny it. I have evidence, again, from a whistleblower inside UNISA. So I have a lot of bones to pick with UNISA. And if their argument is going to be, 
oh, there's no evidence that anybody, uh, you know, is cheating in the exams. I can tell you now, everybody at UNISA knows about this. When I had the meeting at UNISA, various UNISA senior employees came to me to say, you know what, we can't support you openly, but well done, thank you. We are so sick and tired of the mess here. The nepotism is getting out of control. There's a minister's son who's employed there, which is a conflict of interest for that minister. I'm waiting for the name. That's why I'm not willing to say which minister, mm. but very related to UNISA itself, who is employed at UNISA right? Either in a finance or supply chain department. Surprise, surprise. Okay? So I don't want to cast aspersions on anybody. And I don't want to say some, my daughter, if I'm working in a certain place, is not entitled to a job mm -hmm. there. But we have to be very sensitive to conflict of interest. The Zondo Commission reports repeatedly state this. And corruption at some point is not even about the laws. It's about the ethical conduct of leaders mm. or misconduct in this case. And so UNISA needs to go and deal with its rot because they are dragging our name down. Let me tell you something else. If you go to VITS or UCT or Stellenbosch or um, what is the one in Grahamstown, Rhodes. right? Or UFS, UP, University of Pretoria, and you talk about, you know, there's like a standing joke about UNISA, and this has been going on for years. There's these derogatory names that are used in the sector to describe UNISA, something like the, I don't know whether they call it the, what did we used to call the Bantustan universities during apartheid? Mm. The, we used to call them the Bush universities. I know it's a derogatory term, and I didn't create it. Yeah. Please, I don't want Th to be those, sued. Those institutions. I did not create that term. It's been there since I was in high school. I refused to go to a Bush university because I was like, no, there's no way I'm going to a Bush university. I ran away from township schools, thanks to my parents, insisting that I should run away from township schools and go to, and go to other schools where they had to sacrifice to pay a little bit more. So I refused to go to a Bush university. Um, at the standing joke in the academic sector about UNISA, right, is that when the other so-called Ivy, Ivy League universities talk about them, they call them the, 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 the Bush High School, something like that. Maybe not Bush, but something about a high school, some mm. derogatory term. No one will admit to this because everybody knows it's those corridor jokes. Right. The credibility of UNISA's qualifications currently as, as, as over the last, I don't know how many years, everybody knows it's corridor jokes. Right. And so they must sue me for reputational damage that they incurred over years. I'm a public relations practitioner by profession. And um, by the way, that press release they issued. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. It it needs to be. It needs a regulator in in in, in PR. So you know, just to 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 say something about it, mm. to give it an you know some kind of analysis. Because if you're an academic institution and you um, have qualifications in the communication space, at the very least, please write proper press releases. Mm. You know what I mean? That that are that are suited to who you are. So it's like a, a Johannesburg Stock Exchange listed company. It has to comply to something called the SENS. Right, yeah. and it must comply in terms of quality output of communications. That that's not a press release that mm. I, as a public relations practitioner, would approve at that level of an organization, at a senior national level, executive level, even at a at a less operate. I mean, a less lower, slightly lower operational level. So there's a lot of quality problems at UNISA, and these problems are internal. The internal environment is aware of it. Mm. Um, you must remember that before SAA went down, for a good 15 years, there were industry complaints about SAA mm. in the aviation sector. I worked for SAA many years ago. And of course, as employees, we were concerned. But year in, year out, SAA was getting bailouts from the tax. Our money. As far back as, when did I work for SAA? Year 2099, 2000, 2001. SAA had received about 15 billion rands. On average, it was hovering between 10 and 15, maybe 5 and 15. I don't know. Could have been more, could have been less. But several billions of rands. Where is that? Where's the value of that money today? Where's the value of that money? SA is gone. Mm. Gone, done, finished. So are we supposed to keep quiet and pretend that everything is okay when we can see? The country is in a state of permanent disaster. Load shedding, prisoners come out of maximum prison 
leave dead bodies behind with the collusion of employees in the correctional services uh, department. Whether that prison was a private prison or not is irrelevant because the authority of all prisons is uh, the Department of Justice. As mm. much as the authority of education is the Department of Education, even if your school is private. They are the ones who regulate all sorts of things in the sector, so they must take responsibility. We are in deep crisis. The country is on the verge of collapse. The 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 the, the, the debt, what is it, GDP to debt ratio of South Africa mm. is ridiculous. Um, we collect several trillions of rands uh, through SARS every year, mm. and we owe our debt, our government debt, is probably, if not equal to what we collect. Mm. It's a little bit more. I can't remember the last figures. It's between four and five trillion. And we collect around four trillion. So I stand corrected on exactly how much our debt is. But you can check. There's web various websites that can tell you a country's debt. And even those debts are not conclusive. Mm. Because there are various illegal transactions that are done at municipal level. You will remember the VBS bank is a classical example of illegal transactions that were done by municipalities um, going directly against the PFMA, directly against uh, national treasury regulations. And so I could add a whole lot of stuff, save to say, in short, I do not owe UNISA an explanation. I do not owe them an apology, nor do I owe the Council on Higher Education. I'm not going to be intimidated by them. They must send me court papers. I'm going to go to court and defend myself, right? I, I, I'm not going to get lawyers. Uh, I'll have a legal team advising me because I'm not a lawyer. And I will hope that the judge in the high court who will preside over that matter will be a judge who understands that administration of justice in South Africa, which is a constitutional right that we all have as citizens, the efficiency of the administration of justice is much, much, much more important for the sustenance and the continuation of this country and the functional continuation of South Africa is much more important and superior and supersedes constitutionally the right of UNISA to be defamed or not to be defamed. Right. And the, the administration of justice also supersedes. It supersedes. In the context of a country that is collapsing because of corruption, it supersedes any other constitutional rights related to how evidence was um, procured. I'm helping UNISA now. We have, I've already started in court. They're going to challenge some of the reports I'm going to present as evidence based on the fact that um, I didn't obtain the, 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 the evidence legally. Mm -hmm. The administration of justice trumps their right to have evidence procured against them legally. How do you legally get evidence against the criminal? And I'm not calling them criminals. I'm yes. saying hypothetically, in a situation where somebody has robbed your house, yes. this person goes illegally into your house, yes. rapes you, murders you, steals your stuff, all of that is criminal. But you must get evidence against this criminal legally. Yes. How does that happen? So there's various things that UNISA needs to respond to. And I would have been much happier as a citizen of South Africa. I would have been much, much happier if UNISA had demonstrated a better maturity, better emotional maturity, institutional maturity which we all expect them to have mm. as the University of South Africa. They are carrying our flag. The government that's carrying our flag is corrupt to the core, from A to Z, all over, National Assembly, right down to the smallest municipality with six wards. And so there's no pride anymore. There's no national pride. There's no um, patriotism. There's no reason to be proud. We're just proud because we're born here. We're indigenous to this place. We've got nowhere else to go. We're in the southernmost most tip of the world. Um, so if UNISA can carry themselves with a little bit better dignity mm. and stop threatening me as an individual because it smacks of very serious bullying um, and, 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 and invite me to a meeting, invite me and you actually to a meeting, um, to, to, and say, listen, you're a citizen. You don't have money. You're poor. Yes. I mean, you've never even been involved in tender stuff. Yes. So you have no money. You don't have a business. You're not listed on the stock exchange in your business activities. Yeah, you're an entrepreneur. You're trying. You don't even have 50,000 rand in your business account. Wh what's the point of suing you? Mm. Right? We're a university. We are above you. Yes. 
we should call you into a meeting and say, look, we think we are a little bit misguided. Mm. I'm a very reasonable human being. If I'm misguided and if there's evidence against any of the things I've also added. Remember I was talking about the integrity of their qualifications. Yes. I'm now telling you about financial misgovernance. I'm gi I've given you a report that proves governance-related corruption, mm. right? And I've got other pieces of evidence. So if they can prove that all the things that I'm adding now are fraudulently stated by myself, that I'm lying because mm. I have some kind of agenda against UNISA, I don't know. I don't need UNISA's permission to fight them. I don't need anybody's permission to fight them. Mm. If we continue with this attitude in this country, the Tabo Pestas and this guy, Gerard Ackerman, they're just going to continue thriving. Yes. Already as it is as women and children, we are, we, don't, we are not free to move in this country. We don't have freedom of movement. We don't have freedom of association. Because before we associate and move, we must check the coast. Am I going to get raped? Is somebody going to pounce on me? Is government going to threaten to sue me when I talk about their corruption? We are always, always abused. And, and, and the last thing that I want to say in relation to UNISA is that the reason I want them in court and you know, for them to stop threatening me, and they must not sue me. They, well, I suppose they need to sue me. But and I'm not going to give them ammunition legally because they have a law department. Oh, that's another thing. They have a law department. They have a law faculty. One of the unions had to go and march against some institution to force that institution to hire UNISA graduates. Because you know why? They don't want to hire them. In the legal fraternity, there's an unspoken joke that people do not want to, like I'm talking, and I'm not going to mention companies because I'm going to get sued again. Mm. Because we've got a lot of dishonesty in this country. Yes. When you tell the truth, you must be sued, you must be bullied, you must be abused, you must be raped, you must be murdered. Because you're telling the truth. Law firms in this country, top law firms, have got standing jokes about UNISA. They do not want to employ UNISA graduates. A union mobilizing in UNISA had to go and protest outside some organization's premises to, to basically compel them to employ law graduates from UNISA. Why would that be if UNISA had so much integrity? Listen, I worked for um, auditing and accounting firms. I did a lot of consulting work in my life. Um, the big sort of five or big four consulting firms that, that are global firms go to universities, UJ, WITS, University of Pretoria, perhaps even VUT, I don't know, Stellenbosch, UCT, to poach the best, University of Johannesburg, to poach the best graduates, cum laude and above graduates to poach them. So why do people not want to employ? Yes, I'm not suggesting that they don't get employed. Of course, the Department of Justice employs a lot of people, graduates from UNISA, either in the, what do you call this unit that deals legal aid, as well as NPA, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, of course they do. They probably are compelled. They are government. I'm not speaking on their behalf, and I'm not berating it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying, why is the private sector the, the controllers of the, of the law fraternity in South Africa, why are they reluctant to employ UNISA graduates in the law faculty if UNISA has got so much integrity? Mm. I want to I say a few things from, from what you raised. The first one is, I hope it's a correction. I might be wrong. You mentioned four volumes of the Zondo Commission. I think it was five. I also stand to be corrected. Thank you. Um, the SARS collection, I think, currently is at about two trillion, but I do understand that our debt to GDP is extremely high. I don't know if it's at eighty percent or more. And I remember at some point reading that our interest, just from our budget, the interest on our debt takes up, I think, about forty percent of just the budget yet, which means we're just paying interest. Never mind the the principal or the capital. Our, we've we've got a, a serious problem there. Um, you mentioned nepotism. At UNIS, and I wanted to highlight that there's currently, I think they've been asked to step down, the vice chancellor of the Un Stellenbosch University, and I think a registrar as, as well. It's a, it's a white gentleman who's the vice chancellor, and I think the registrar is a white female. Speaking about nepotism, because I think there's also children that were put in the institution not following due process. Um, 
when you spoke about push varsities, I wanted to say, you're right, in my opinion, my experience, that to this day, UNISA graduates are treated as less than in corporate, not just in law. I was in auditing. I was signed with a, a big auditing firm. Auditing in, in the legal fraternity, in banking, and in other spaces, which is very sad because UNISA was always a very top institution, especially for distance yes. learning back in the day. You know, it, it served a very a very important function in this country. The sad thing is you mentioned Bantustan institutions, and to this day, they also get treated as less than. You look at a Forte, you look at the University of Zululand, amongst others, and to this day, they treat us like, it's almost like there's these elite clubs in the space. You go and you study. Kabang, you come from a mud hut or, or a shack in an informal settlement, and you go and you get NSFAS, and you go and you study, and you get your qualification, but they say it's not from the right place. So there's, there's, there's problems everywhere. I, I am sensitive and I'm hurt and I'm emotional about the bullying that you're feeling. And it's not you. I mean, you have been in politics. You speak well. You are brave. But there have been brave people who have been killed. There are brave people who maybe don't have platforms and they are scared. And we are building a nation of people that are fearful to speak the truth, who have access to corruption and to evidence and are scared to share it out because we argue today that the courts are captured because you will send it and it will be thrown out and, and scratched off the, the roll because it's we have to scrape this off. The evidence wasn't collected legally, but how do you get it legally? Because these people will not let it get out, but it's there. Thank you for sharing your side. I think from my side, um, I apologize to UNISA students and graduates. I, I know a lot of them study very hard for their qualifications and the onus is on UNISA to give them comfort and the Council on Higher Education to also ensure that they crack the whip and the Department of Higher council Education. For, council no, on. Council on. I made sure. <laughs> okay. I definitely That's made I sure. For. I'm like, oh, the spell checker is going to be out there. Shame. Um, I hope they'll checker. also apologize to you for misspelling your surname. It's it's Mashiho yes, I with actually, an yes, E and not an I. Okay, officially, thanks. Sorry for cutting you short. Yeah. Officially, I do need the Council on Higher Education to spell my surname correctly sure. as an indigenous citizen of this country. My surname is Mashiho, M-A-S-H-E-G-O. I is not Mashiho. Yeah. And I take offense. I, I'm very, very offended, actually, that yeah. they misspelled my surname. Um, when I read the UNISA communication, I also, and a whole lot of other people that are my colleagues were like, is this a real thing? Who wrote it? Yeah, it looked like actually a joke, right? Yeah. I mean, I know when somebody sent it to me, and maybe I'm fussy because that's my profession, yeah. communications. I was like, this is this is a joke. That's what I literally said. I said, no, this is a joke. This isn't real. Somebody, maybe the SRC wrote it. Yeah. That's what I said. Because the SRC did issue something initially. And yes, I mean, I'm not insensitive. I, I, I do feel for anybody who, I mean, there's a lot of problems now in the higher, uh, I mean, in secondary, is it secondary, secondary education uh, in high schools where oh, okay. often they, they discover um, institutions that are not properly registered with the Department of Education. Right. Yeah. Uh, you you often have these leakages, um, and it's a it's almost like an annual thing now. It is an annual thing. A, a leakage of a metric exam, but here's the difference. It's called reputation management in my trade. Right. Yeah. In communication science, we have a field called reputation management, because that's exactly what a reputation needs. It needs to be managed. All of us need to manage our reputations. That does not mean we don't do bad things. We don't mm. do wrong things. Yes, we do. Um, but we must do them in such a way that is say to and corporations need to take care of his sab. So I'm not sure why UNISA, to be honest, responded this way. For me, their response is also very suspicious. Suspicious. Mm. It's not the response of a corporation yeah. that has thousands of employees. I think about seven or eight thousand. And sorry, I beg to differ on how much money SARS collects. The fiscus it's way over two trillion. Okay. You might be referring to one area. It could be the because I did read a report on SARS that the highest contributors towards um, our fiscus is, is pay as you earn. Mm. So it could be just that pay as you earn bracket, excluding corporate taxes and all of that. But again, I stand corrected. Yeah. Sure. Um, UNISA needs to do what Uma Lucy does. Do you understand? Mm. When there's accusations of that kind, you don't respond with a fight. You don't come out gloves, you know. To an individual citizen. To a, a, a woman. You firstly, you educate the citizen 
then you educate the public. But more than anything else, you lay their fears to rest. Yeah. You actually deal with the fear because I'm fearful for this situation, as I've explained. So, Uma Lucy, when there's a leakage of metric papers, to demonstrate it's not an institutional corruption thing, mm. it's some individuals who were involved in the process of compiling the, the exam who decide to be corrupt themselves. Like I said, as, citi as South African citizens, we have a societal corruption problem, mm. right? So it's whoever, administrators, employees, whoever they are who get involved with putting up the, the metric paper that decide we, they're going to sell the paper to make money. Mm. And then what does Uma Lucy do year in, year out? That's classical reputation management 101. UNISA can learn a lot from that. When they are accused of having people who walk into an exam room with an ID belonging to Penuel, and this person is not Penuel, mm. and they write an exam, and there's no invigilation process that, that, that steps in, they need to correct us. Yes. Not threaten me. Not threaten me. Take me to court. For what? What, am I, what are they going to get out of it? They're going to sue me for how much? So Uma Lucy leads with example. The Department of Education, basic education, at times leads with example, right? We know there's over 2,000 schools with pit toilets. That's not leading by example, right? But at times they lead by example. Mm. They will issue statements to say that between them and Uma Lucy, there's investigations to weed out the thugs who are robbing the system and, 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 and challenging and threatening the integrity of our metric examination. To date, our metric exams are not threatened globally mm. or anywhere in the world because they know that these are human, I mean, human um, uh, crime uh, activities that lead to the, newspaper, I mean, to, the, to the exam paper being leaked um, for, 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 purposes, for nefarious reasons, for people who want to actually make money out of the paper. And then they investigate. Often, sometimes they even withdraw the paper, amend it, change it, and issue a different paper. Why, why is UNISA not wanting to do that as, as a university, as a university in higher education, right? And, and, and you mentioned um, the, the, the other issues related to the, to the discrimination in the, in the labor market, mm. where if you're a graduate from a certain school, you're not going to be, you know, shortlisted or whatever, unless you're like really super, super smart, yeah. of course. Um, we have massive corruption across all the universities, if not most of them, the public universities. You mentioned incidents of nepotism at Stellenbosch and somebody stepping down. Yeah. There's a report at UNISA that has been hidden until I took it out about the same problems. Hmm. And like I said, there's a minister's son who works for UNISA as an employee in a finance or supply chain, some kind of finance-related admin role. So maybe as citizens, we need to decide what do we want. Yeah. Do we want a country that is completely corrupt, where we know that there's no queue anymore at home affairs? I must get in with 100 rand. I give somebody 100 rand, I go to the front of the queue. Is that the country we want? Is, do we want a country where there's no exams? It's pass one, pass all. Mm. Do we want a country where I can get an MBA? I dropped out of my MBA, by the way, at Gibbs. I just felt like I had too much experience and a lot of the stuff I felt like... <laughs> I mean, maybe that was me and my high and mighty attitude, but uh, yeah, I got two credits, <laughs> so I can still go in and finish it. But do we want a Mandisa with an MPA that is questionable, mm. that someone else wrote for her? Mm. Trust me, I've had those offers from people offering to write PhDs for me. I'm like, I've got a cum laude. I mean, it might only be a BTEC, but I've got a cum laude and a bursary from University of uh, KZN, but my daughter was in high school and I couldn't afford to go back to school full time. I love studying. Mm. I actually like learning and applying the knowledge that I have. Mm. It's the most fulfilling thing. It's the most um, satisfying thing. Yeah. When you can learn something, apply it, and it works. Yeah. And you're like, oh, my God, I can do this. It's creation, right? I like to create. And I, I like to think that the whole of South Africa is in that space where we want to create honestly. Yeah. We want to create honest spaces. We want to create safe spaces. By the way, the knowledge economy is the one single economy where women have a fair chance. It's the one single economic sector, rather, mm. where women have a fair chance. Because if I'm given a fair chance to learn, mm. trust me, I'm going to trump you. But if it's unfair and you've got an advantage, you've already seen the question paper, mm. you, you've got a, a professor writing an exam for you, a thesis for you, where's the fairness? Yeah. How are we going to build this economy? 
without meritocracy. Universities are the beacon of hope. But I'm sorry, from what I'm seeing at UNISA, from what we are all seeing at Forte, where three people already have been killed, from what we're hearing about UKZN, from rumors, other whistleblowers that have approached me about, um, not is it TUT, I think it's TUT. I have a whistleblower with massive amounts of information about what's happening at TUT. That is why I called Blade a thug. Because, by the way, if you're a minister or an MEC or an MMC, if you're an executive in government, there's a clause in the Constitution and in the PFMA that states very clearly that if there's corruption and maladministration and wrongdoing in the department that you are politically presiding over, then you are personally to be held liable. So if there's thuggery happening in the universities, public universities, guess who's the thug in charge of that thuggery? The minister. So I'm repeating that again. And so it's just very tragic because we live in a crime-infested country. It's winter. We've got no lights. We're on stage six load shedding. Going to eight. We can't do anything about it. Can't do anything about it. We can't complain about it. We can't complain about corruption at ESCOM. Gwede Mantache gets interviewed by um, some journalist on one of the uh, broadcast uh, TV stations about um, this problem. And he's praising employees at ESCOM. Oh, ESCOM employees are so wonderful. They need to be reassured. They need to be patted on the back. And, um, oh, the minister is doing so well. The new minister of electricity is doing wonderful work. So... If I praise myself for bad, if I reward bad behavior, right? If, I re if you reward your child for bad behavior, what are you saying to that child? You're breeding a little criminal. Mm. Because you're saying to your, to your child, okay, you can do anything, and especially when you do wrong things, I'll pat you on the back. So what Mantasha was saying in that interview is that, no, no, no. Actually, ESCOM is perfect. In fact, he even narcissistically accuses South Africans of being ungrateful. The amount of money they are looting from us daily in government, across all segments of government, across all state-owned entities. Anyway, there aren't many state-owned entities left that are viable, by the way. And uh, we are not supposed to complain about their corruption. So this is a totalitarian state. UNISA's behavior is totalitarian. It's authoritarian, mm. it's bullying, it's dictatorial, it's misogynistic, it's not transparent. Governance is about transparency. A university must be the beacon of governance, the beacon of governance. They must never, ever be found wanting because our qualifications must be credible. By the way, if your qualifications are not credible, not only are you wasting people's monies, you're also affecting the economy badly because you're not putting the skills that the economy requires. A university is there to put skills, critical skills that we require in the economy. And that is why it's important to safeguard the integrity of that certification. That is why Umalusi year in, year out, makes sure proactively that they challenge the leakage of metric exams. To make sure that all of us are clear that, oh, these are little criminals in the department that are doing this. It's not Umalusi and it's not the department. Mm -hmm. It's individuals that need to be reined in. ESCOM has collapsed. SAA is gone. Um, Danal, all the state-owned entities Transnet. are gone. Transnet, I, I mean, from what I'm hearing now. about Transnet is, is that it's virtually just being finished off right now. That's what I've been told. Yeah. I don't know if it's true. The post office currently... I worked for Transnet at some point. Transnet was one of the, the most profitable. I don't know about Airport's company. Airport's company used to give lots of profits at some point, about two billion net profits, back to the Department of Transport as they are, uh, uh, you know, as the department that that that, that houses them, mm. as a private company belonging to the state. Um, it, it's 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 a tragedy. It's a complete tragedy. You know the the Tabo Besta story is 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 a is a mic is a microcosm actually, of what is happening everywhere, in government. I posted a picture the other day. I was walking. I do my usual. Not I don't run anymore because bad for my knees. But I was doing my um, three day a week walk, and I walked past one of the substations in my area, that was wide open. All the doors to the substation were wide open. In this day and age of technology. 
We have no technology to safeguard our su- substations during load shedding crisis when electricity production, transmission and preservation to make sure that everybody gets the electricity is at such a huge threat. We have a municipality in the city of Joburg that couldn't be bothered. They will not go and reinforce. There's no effort to close off the substations. There's no effort to bring in technology. When there's so much technology in the world to do majority stuff virtually, when there's so much technology, artificial intelligence um, brought by the fourth industrial revolution, so-called, that can actually safeguard our, 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 our substations to make sure that the little bit of electricity we have access to is reliable, we get it on time, and that we do not put more burden on us, the ratepayers. We are ratepayers. We are the customers of the municipality to keep on putting in money into a bottomless pit where you keep on fixing the same thing, keep on fixing the same thing. Instead of taking that money, using it in the economy, building a viable economy, there's green economic opportunities. You know, I'm very passionate about that space and I'm actually involved in my business in that space to actually build a South Africa that has no unemployment. Gwede Mantashe tells us we must be grateful because during apartheid, only certain percentage of the population had electricity. So we must be grateful for four hours or six hours of electricity during the day. We must be grateful for all the companies that have collapsed because of the electricity crisis. We must be grateful for all the crime that has gone up, children that are being molested because mostly they are in the dark. We must be grateful for women who can't walk in the street because they get raped. We must be grateful that poor people are going to freeze to death this winter because we are now reaching stage 10. And then he even has the nerve to go on and say, oh yes, no, we are making great improvement to electricity. What is it? Is it the emperor and the invisible cloak story? Mm. Am I supposed to imagine electricity in order to realize Gwede Mantashe's dream of the improving ESCOM and us not being allowed to criticize anybody who's stealing, who's incompetent, who's just doing everything in their power to make sure that we become just another failed African state? We can't allow that. We can't allow that. They inherited this country with less than 10% unemployment in 1994, they should be ashamed of themselves. I'm talking percentages now, not the actual people, Mm. proportion. Less than double digit, we are now sitting on 60% unemployment. And we must be happy about that. We must be proud. When we raise issues about a public university that carries our name, we must be threatened and bullied. I won't be threatened and bullied by UNISA. They can forget it. They must come. I don't have money. That's why I want them in court. I've got, there's no money for them to take from me. Mm. I don't have money. Where must I get money from? I just got fired for calling UNISA corrupt, by the way. You got fired? Yes. So you've had personal... I don't want to talk further of... about that because I'm going to get sued by those guys as well. You lost your job because yeah, of this Yeah, because UNISA I called UNISA story. corrupt because I, yeah, I was told that I'm not allowed to talk about corruption. I was like, listen... You know, I love it when a man tells me you are not allowed to do something. My own father would never tell me not to do something. My father made me a feminist. My father was a knowledge warrior. He was like, when you're a girl, you better be a lot more skilled and educated than everybody else because there's vultures out there. So prepare yourself to be able to stand on your own. What are they going to do to me? Bazongbulala. It's okay. I said this many, many times. I was issued death threats in Alexandra in 2019 before Lebohang Maile and Paul Mashatile t- t- sued me. Well, they didn't sue me. They sent me papers telling me that they're going to sue me. I said, no, let's go to court. Let's go to court. You can't collapse government budgets. Ba- coming. I've been paying tax since the mid, mid late 90s. I've been a taxpayer since then. I'm not, I'm not working in a country uh, where we as citizens become, uh, I don't know, we, we must live like rats and crawl in and out of our holes because we are scared of the big, scary government people. Oh, because I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah, of course I'm doing business with government. I don't care. I'm doing business with government. They must tell me why I'm not allowed to do business with government. They must mm-hmm. give me one reason why I can't do work for any government department. What have I done? Do I not have skills? Am I not efficient? Am I not professional? Do I not deliver when I do work? Of course I deliver. But the misogyny, the right to loot our money, unfettered, uncontrolled, unmonitored, 
the, the fear mongering. I must, I'm not going to live in fear. I'd sooner be dead. Let Eunice organize a hitman to come and kill me. I'm not a difficult person to find. I don't have bodyguards I've never ever had. I can't afford them. I've never been able to afford them. Nor do I want them. I'm a free, I like freedom. <laughs> I love to be free. And so whether they kill me, whether they, they, they lock all business opportunities for me in government, whether they, um, they threaten me, they insult me in public, it's not going to change the reality of their own rot. And if they love this country, they will do what I said earlier. They'll call me around the table the way the union at UNISA did and talk to me like mm. a human being, like an adult. I don't benefit from any of their nonsense, nor do I want to. Mm. But I'm not going to be threatened by thugs. It's not going to happen. As Eva, this is Mandis. Um, Thank you so much for coming through. Thank you for being such a deeply passionate patriot. Um, I think I find my patriotism wavering at times. And I appreciate having people like you to remind us that, look, there were people that, and there, are, there were people, there are people that have been fighting for this country, that have died for this country. And it's up to the ordinary citizen to stop being scared and to stand up and to speak and to share information and to hold so-called leaders accountable because we work every day we pay tax, we do try our best, and we're not being met just halfway. So thank you so much. I'm going to challenge all the people that are going to watch this to correct any of the information that we may have gotten wrong or right. Yes. To share any links to any related information so that we can all learn. Yes. And to commit themselves to do better. And not just to the people that are going to be watching, to every politician that's going to be watching this, to every tender premier that's going to be watch, watching this I urge them to educate themselves on how countries are built on how economies are built and to understand I've, I've mentioned this on another platform how when they milk a cow till it bleeds the cow gets infected and it dies and if they think their children their grandchildren are going to have any milk Ferraris. No, their or children anything. are not going to have Ferraris. There's eh? going to be nothing here. Mm, there won't even be roads to drive the Ferraris yes. on. And their children will suffer more than us because we've already been insulated against poverty. Their so children are not insulated against poverty. They, they need to catch a wake up for themselves, for their self-interest to do things better sustainably for the future. Thank you for joining us and I look forward to sitting with you again. Thank you, Peñol.